holy orders, holy orders, priesthood. If you come across our Protestant brothers and sisters, they will always say, there is no need for you to have a priest. We don't need any human intermediaries to approach God in prayer or in worship. Because, you know, before, uh, the worshippers during the time of the Jews, before Christ, could not even, could not go in to the, inside the the ark of the covenant where the ark of the covenant is only the priest could go in there but that was during the time when Christ has not yet come but when Christ came and when that uh, curtain of the temple after he died on the cross was uh, torn in half then. It signified that we have direct access to the Lord ourselves. So they say, now we don't need a priest. You can go directly to God. We don't need these intermediaries. Because, and then they would even quote to you 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. And they, they'll say that, you know, we are now, we were once no people, but now we are God's people. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. A holy nation, a people of his own. So we are now all priests. Is that correct? Yes. That is correct. We all share common priesthood. In the sense that we can approach God directly. <coughs> However, we have also ministerial priesthood. What is a ministerial priesthood? A ministerial priesthood is a special type of priesthood. Because this is a priesthood that gives the power to perform specific sacred duties. Like for instance, what? The consecration of the bread. It becomes the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Only the priests who were, or, were ordained with to, be, to discharge that sacred, sacred power given. That is a ministerial priesthood. The ordination of the priest. Paragraph 1538 states by ordination uh, ordination and then somewhere in the middle now. Confers a gift of the Holy Spirit that permits the exercise of a sacred power. Are you on <coughs> which can come only from Christ himself through his church permits the exercise of a sacred power that is what our priests have they alone have that sacred power you remember when we took up last time the delegation of the power to forgive that is a sacred power only the priest can hear confession not even the deacon can do that that's the special power. So we call that the ministerial priesthood because they stand in the place of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is as if Christ is the one forgiving our sins. Christ is the one bringing about the, the uh, change of the body and blood into his own flesh. But he uses, he gave the power, the sacred power to the priest upon their ordination to discharge this sacred function. That is what ministerial priesthood is. We are all priests, but we are, we are not all ministerial priests. Okay? So that's the difference. Because they are in their special apostolic ministry. Right? So what, that is what priesthood really is all about. Okay. Let's talk about celibacy. What do you think? Should priests get married? Huh? <laughs> Should they remain celibate? Yeah, let's talk about celibacy. You know, celibacy was not a discipline in the church until about, I think, 300 AD in the Council of Elvira in Spain. So before, you don't need... Although Paul uh, voluntarily uh, remained single, because, because he thought that, 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 that he would be more effective in his ministry as single, as celibate. But that was not a discipline imposed. Most of the apostles were married. Okay? All right. But
But why do we need to be, why, why did the church decide to uh, have this discipline of celibacy? By the way, this is just a discipline. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a teaching of faith or morals. It can change. It can change. There can come a time when a priest can, will be allowed by, 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 by the Pope to marry. But I don't think any Pope would, would even consider that now because they have seen the wisdom of the, of the uh, discipline of celibacy. You know why? They did leave uh, this uh, discipline of celibacy right after, uh, during the Dark Ages. And what was the result? The priest became more and more secularized. You know, they spent more time with their family and probably became more, more interested in acquiring wealth for the family rather than serving his people. So, you know, priests, celibate priests are actually married. And they are married to, they always say, our spouse is the congregation. That's, my, that's our family. Our spouse is the church and our family is the congregation. So, it only makes sense that a priest would have all the time to focus all their life, to devote all their life to the service of the church. In fact, Paul uh, has <coughs> a very succinct way of <coughs> stating the importance of celibacy in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 32 to 35. I should like you to be free of anxieties. An unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord. How he may please the Lord. But a married man is anxious about the things of the world. How he may please his wife. And he is divided. And then if you, you jump to verse 35. I am telling you this for your own benefit. Not to impose a restraint upon you. But for the sake of propriety and adherence to the Lord. Without distraction. So you can be distracted. You know, I went to the diaconate program for, for about a year. And it has always been emphasized to us that even if you're already ordained as a, uh, as a deacon, make sure that you don't lose your focus on your family, on your own family. See, that was the advice. Your, 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 your first mission is always your family. So, it is true. If you are married, your first mission is your family. Right? So, whereas if you are celibate, your priority is the communication. So celibacy is a very, very good discipline in the church. And I hope that there will never come a time when they will get this discipline again. Not during the not in the time of Pope Benedict this is. I don't think the the, uh, the the proponents of uh, the lifting of celibacy would ever succeed with Pope Benedict the sixteen. He knows the value of celibacy. Okay. And then, of course, the argument about that is why, why, why should you, should you impose uh, this discipline? Didn't Jesus, didn't God even say that go here and multiply? Why can't they not have their, their own children? Yeah. Of course, that doesn't make sense. Jesus Christ himself was celibate. Saint Paul himself was celibate. So it is a calling. It's a special calling. John the Baptist was celibate. This is a special calling. It's the dedication of your whole life. Well, what about this objection that we open here? Why do you call your priest father? You know, if you open your scripture to Matthew 23, verse 9, it is very clear in scripture, it seems that Jesus Christ categorically stated not to call anyone father. It's in verse 9, call no one on earth your father. You have but one father in heaven. So why do you call your priest father? So when you read this scriptural passage, you should look at it in its context. So what's the context in chapter 23? Look at verse 6. 
before that Jesus Christ was really you know criticizing the Pharisees he was critical of the Pharisees why? verse 5 all their works are performed to be sin See? so their motivation he noticed was all centered up on themselves on themselves they love praises verse 6 they love praises of honor at banquets seats of honor in synagogues greetings in marketplaces and the salutation rabbi as for you do not be called rabbi you have but one teacher you are all brothers then call no one on earth your father you have but one father in heaven so what's the context Jesus Christ was teaching the people that you should not be like these Pharisees who seem to misuse the authority given them. The Pharisees were teachers. They were scribes. Okay. But they are misusing that authority. And he says, haven't you forgotten from whom your authority came from? So, call no one father. You are not your own authority. Your, the real source of your authority is the Father in heaven. That was what Christ was to say. So it's a hyperbole. Okay? He was using this in order to point to us that the source of all authority is God himself. Okay? That's why in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15, even Paul himself said that I am your spiritual father. So the priest, we call them father because you know we have a special relationship with them. And, and, and that special relationship uh, deserves a, 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 a real high respect for them, like we respect our parents. So we call them father. And of course, they are father in the sense that they are the head of the household of God in our own respective communities. See, we are all families. So they are the father in the family of God in your own community. So that's, my, that's how you explain Matthew 23, verse 9. You call them father because actually our priests are our spiritual father. That's why we all, they give us always spiritual direction. And their ordination has given them the <coughs> sacred power to, <coughs> to perform sacred duties for the Lord. Okay? So by the way, uh, even in scripture, there are so many references to uh, people of God as father like Joseph in Genesis chapter 45 verse 8 he said God made me a father to Pharaoh and you know Elisha when, when, when Elijah was being brought up to heaven he, he called on him and he cried my father my father in Acts chapter 7 verse 2 you know Stephen when he was being stoned to death before he was stoned to death he was referring to, to Abraham as father Abraham and in Romans chapter 9, verse 10, there's a reference to a father, Isaac. So, it is not to be taken literally. The prohibition of calling one as a father is really a prohibition of not recognizing the source of authority who is God alone.